today, taking the lid off Bitcoin. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And I'm joined again by Adrian Polozny from Independent Reserve. Hello, Adrian. Hey, how are you doing, Martin? Look, it's great to have you back on the show again. I know last time we, we discussed a bit more about the total business and a few people said, oh, you're spooking you know, their business model. But today I really want to drill into... Bitcoin in more detail, right? Because sure. a few things have happened. You know, the price has gone up in the last few months. Uh, we know that there's a halving ahead. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whilst there's a whole portfolio and pantheon of different cryptos, Bitcoin is still the master, isn't it? So yes, it is. it's yeah. really important to, I guess, understand what's going on. So I really wanted to have a bit of a deep, deeper dive today. And um, maybe let's just start with a general overview of, you know, what Bitcoin is and how it compares with uh, other forms of currency and money. Sure. So it's basically a peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency. And what that means is it's not controlled by any government. It's not controlled by any institution, any individual. And it allows anyone to send money to basically anyone else, anywhere in the world, pretty much instantly and almost for free. So um, it's basically a form of money that disintermediates, you know, the institutions that we're kind of used to having, uh, I guess, you know, handle money on our behalf. So it removes, it removes basically the credit card companies, it removes the banks. It's basically a network of people connecting with each other, transferring value. Right. So it's um, blockchain enabled and it's uh, independent of uh, centralized control. Now, it's very interesting. I don't know whether you saw, but the Bank of England recently published a paper. And basically, they argued that if you think about um, the critical requirements for Bitcoin to be a currency, which is a store of value and a you know, medium of exchange, um, they said the problem we've got is that the speculative nature of Bitcoin makes it very hard to know what its value is. And therefore, in terms of actually being a useful um, proxy for a currency, it doesn't actually pass the test yet. Um, what's your thought on that? Uh, so I think it's important to note that it's still very early on. So I guess the price discovery process is still happening right now. So yes, I guess the price has moved up and down a lot since uh, I guess Bitcoin uh, was invented almost 10 years ago now, maybe more than 10 years ago now. Uh, I guess when, you know, it came to life it wasn't worth anything then it was worth one cent and last i checked it was worth uh fifteen thousand australian dollars and i can definitely understand the argument that if you know most goods and services are still priced in aud if you were to you know earn um basically uh your own money in a different currency whether it's a cryptocurrency or any other currency you basically run an fx risk that you know the what you're earning may be worth not the same thing tomorrow as what it is today. Um, I think over time, as the market cap of Bitcoin increases, we'll see the volatility reduce. But right now, it's obvious that it's still very volatile. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that's probably the point, right? So whilst the um, central banks may claim that it is really too volatile to be a currency, the real answer is it's too volatile to be a currency yet, right? Because if the penetration continues and the volume increases, um, chances are down the track there will be more stability in it. But it, 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 I think you know the, the difficulty is that people sort of look at it just as today without thinking about perhaps where it may, may go. Although yeah. the other issue, of course, is that at the moment we have bitcoins on a number of independent exchanges and in fact they all, are all effectively slightly differently priced although i suppose there's always an arbitrage reason as to why yeah. the prices tend to move together but nevertheless it, it, it is decentralized and it is actually um you know managed and controlled through disparate exchanges around the world absolutely yes so i guess uh there are maybe a hundred exchanges around the world or more uh they're not connected with each other in any real way other than the fact that people trade across all these exchanges and if they see an arbitrage opportunity they will exploit this opportunity so you've kind of got this invisible hand of the market making sure that the price around all the exchanges remains pretty much the same yeah and i guess also it's worth reflecting on the fact that given the mess that central banks have made 
to our economies around the world with their quantitative easing and their um, ultra low interest rates you know maybe it's a good thing that effectively there there is an alternative to all of this central bank manipulation intervention yeah so a lot of people like bitcoin because they see it as hard money and i guess what that means is it's immune from any i guess authoritative party from easing it so no one can print more bitcoin no one can just all of a sudden create more bitcoin other than what the algorithm allows and the algorithm is built in a way to make sure that bitcoin are released over time in a predictable manner so we know that there'll never be more than 21 million bitcoin in existence right now we're at about 18 and a half million so there's only about two and a half left to 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 to, to be added into the economy and they're released in a way that the uh, inflation rate reduces over time. So right now, the inflation rate of Bitcoin is about 3.6%, which means that every year there'll be 3.6% more Bitcoin than there was the year before. And in about three months, on roughly May the 12th, this will halve to 1.8%. So, right, right. Now that's really important. So you've just you've brought in the concept of halving, and it's really important people understand this, right? Because I read all sorts of rubbish about what halving actually means. So basically, it's the rate of growth. Correct. Yes. Right. And, and this will roughly halve every four years. So yep. in three months it'll be one point eight percent. In four years it'll be under one percent, and then it'll just keep halving, 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 hmm. until at some point in about fifty or sixty years, no new Bitcoin will be produced, or just minute amounts of Bitcoin we produce. So it's basically like an asymptote at uh, basically, so you can't ever reach 21 million, but Bitcoin's divisible to eight decimal places. So at some point it'll be 21 million to the accuracy of eight decimal places, but it's an asymptote because <laughs> it keeps halving. Right, and, and that was wired in from the original conception of Bitcoin, right? By yeah, that's um, right. Satoshi, who is the mystical figure behind it all. Yeah, so I mean, I, I can't speculate, you know, as to why he did it like that. But I guess um, a lot of people think that it's because it wants, you know, that he wanted it to be modeled on the mining process of a precious resource, like, say, a gold, right? So I guess if we look at the mining of gold over time, you know, uh, I guess say one million years ago there was lots of easy gold around there was gold in the rivers and there was gold in the mountains and you know once people realized that they like gold they started getting this gold right and then say 1000 years later that easy gold was gone and it became harder to get more gold you know all of a sudden you had to dig a hole in the ground and then that was gone and then you realized well we really like this gold we want to get more of it but we got to dig a bigger hole and it becomes more and more expensive to get the gold out of the ground and ultimately there's an amount of gold in the earth and that's been around from the beginning of earth and you know you can't produce more gold on earth right now i mean there's asteroid mining or whatever but if you just assume that what we have on the earth is what we'll ever have that's kind of how the bitcoin mining process also works right and if i sort of charted the halvings are they sort of linear or are they effectively you know tailoring off as, as, as they approach that um, that target uh, so they're linear in a sense in that they happen every four years, right? But there's an asymptote at 21 million, and you know if you keep halving anything, yeah, uh, the effect of that halving will be less and less and less because you're halving a smaller number going forward. Yeah, right. So it's really a logarithmic um, sort of. Th that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. So I guess then that's a really interesting question. You know, what effect does a halving have on miners and mm -hmm. on people who hold bitcoins? So the miners are basically a group of people on the network and it's important to note that anyone can become a miner all you need is the computer hardware to validate transactions on the network so the service that miners provide is basically making sure that the network works the way it's intended to work so if i send you some bitcoin the miners will make sure that i can't also send that bitcoin to anyone else so you can trust transactions on the networks so they provide a very important thing for the network the network wouldn't work without the miners so the mining process is expensive in the sense that it requires a lot of computer hardware, requires electricity. So there's all these investments that the miners have to make. So they need to be, um, they need to have an incentive to make that investment. And the way that incentive works is every time a miner mines a block, which basically means they round up, you know, the transactions that happened since the last block and they do it in a way that's difficult for anyone else to replicate and everyone else agrees that this is a valid block the network 
issues that minor with right now 12 and a half new Bitcoin. So this is the way new Bitcoins issued into the ecosystem. And it's kind of the reason why this, uh, why increasing, which is currently at a rate of 3.6%. So when we have that, that issuance, it'll mean that miners, rather than making 12 and a half Bitcoin every time they mine a block, they'll earn six and a quarter Bitcoin. So the reward that they receive for the work they do will have. So that's going to have some interesting consequences for them, right? Because the miners have ongoing expenses and, you know, they have to pay for electricity, they have to pay for their staff, they have to replace computer hardware. And most of these expenses are denominated in uh, Australian dollars, US dollars or wherever, wherever they happen to be, right? So there's usually, um, a re usually when a, um, a miner receives a reward, they have to go to an exchange and they have to liquidate the Bitcoin that they received in order to pay their expenses. So there's a constant stream of new Bitcoin coming onto exchanges from the miners, which causes the price to be what it is right now. And in May, that stream of Bitcoin coming onto exchanges will most likely halve. So that should have an effect on the price. And it will also have an effect on basically all the miners out there. So there could be a group of miners who aren't as efficient as other miners, and they'll probably have to stop because they just can't make money anymore unless the price of Bitcoin were to increase. And if say the price of Bitcoin were to go up by 100%, even though they're getting half the Bitcoin, if it's worth twice as much, then they'll still be able to operate. So there'll be all these interesting things going on. Right. So the implication, um, you know, there have been halvings before. So what did the price do in response to those halvings previously? So we've had two halvings before. Uh, the first one was eight years ago, and the price went up about 100x uh, within around one year after the halving. Uh, the previous one uh, was in 2015, 16, around that time. Mm. And uh, the price went up from about six or $700 to about $20,000. That's when we had that huge cryptocurrency bubble that I guess a lot of people remember. Right. And so do you think the halving effectively could well be a trigger for people saying, oh, it's going to go up? So, of course, you know, if you think about the way exchanges work, more people buy and sell and trade and therefore the yeah. demand goes up, therefore the price goes up. Is that sort of the mechanism? Yeah. So what we normally see, I guess, before every halving is there's, I guess, the media interest. So I guess people like yourself are, are interested in this and, mm. you know, people talk about this, this halving mm. and that causes... Uh, I guess more people to start looking at cryptocurrencies that that's causing more people to, to think well maybe I'll invest now so uh, that usually has um, an effect on the price and also on the other side you've got the miners who now are liquidating half as much as what they used to which will also have an effect on the price so in the past those two effects combined have basically meant that you know there was a huge spike in the price Mm. Not to say this will happen again, but that's what happened last time. Yeah, well, interesting. And, of course, nobody quite knows, given everything else that's going on at the moment, as to <laughs> where we'll be in May. But uh, Yeah, so it's yeah. also important to note that the market we have now is very different to the market yep. um, at the last halving. It's a lot more mature. We've got futures markets, options markets. Uh, it's very highly leveraged. So it just may not react in the way it reacted last time. It's, uh, yeah, it's really hard well, to say. And we know that there are even some investment banks now playing around the edges as well, aren't they? That's right. So we, we've kind of seen the beginnings of institutional adoption um, in, in this area. So a lot of people have been trying to launch an ETF um, in the US uh, hasn't quite gotten off the ground yet. Uh, <laughs> but, but I guess it'll happen in the next one year or two, uh, whether it's in the US, in Australia or in Europe, it's, it'll almost definitely happen. Um, so, so there's kind of new ways to get into this space, ways that are more friendly for institutional investors. Now it's possible to get insurance and cryptocurrency. All these things that institutional investors kind of need to get involved are uh, beginning to come online. So we are seeing interest from like a whole di different diff different kind of area uh, at the moment than what we've seen in the past. Hmm. Um, it's interesting that I guess Bitcoin, you know, was initially driven by the retail interest and, and now institutional interest is kind of um, beginning to come online. It's kind of the opposite of what we usually see in other markets that start off, you know, on the institutional side, and then retail investors kind of get involved um, afterwards. So it's it's um, I guess evolved in in a way that's a little bit uncommon. 
Yeah, well, I think that evolution process is very interesting. And of course, if you if you think about it from a central bank's perspective, as this gets more um, momentum and effectively as you know more institutions start to play, then central banks then get more twitchy because basically the, it's beyond their control, isn't it? And and so there is a real tussle going on at the moment between effectively you know central bank digital currencies um, like. Uh, Fed coin in the U.S. and you know other Fed, uh, other banks around the world, and central banks around, are now beginning to experiment with different types of uh, central bank digital currency, versus the devolved Bitcoin and its um you know man, many other um, um, sort of comparative um, uh, cryptocurrencies, or in fact slightly different cryptocurrencies. So there's a really interesting tussle ahead, and I'll yeah. be interested to see. Nobody knows how this is going to play out. I think. Um, and, you know, even though I guess a lot of the banks are beginning to issue their own. Uh, you know, the, 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 the beginning to look at the technology behind Bitcoin and seeing mm. how they can use that technology to make the, I guess, you know, to get the, um, uh, the efficiency gains, I suppose. It's important to note that any currency issued by a bank, even though it may run on, run on a blockchain, is not the same thing as a Bitcoin because yeah. it's controlled by an entity. Yeah. And the whole thing about Bitcoin is that nobody controls it. So it's important to understand that there is a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the critical point, right? Because effectively, the central banks like to have the control and all the levers, money supply and, uh, yeah. you know, interest rates and those things. And effectively, the likes of Bitcoin and, uh, and other um, cryptocurrencies are effectively outside that system. And Correct. now the twain shall we meet, right? Yeah. So, so people shouldn't think that, um, you know, the central bank digital currencies are actually based on the same basis as the, uh, the Bitcoins, right? And they might yeah. use the same blockchain technologies, but they are fundamentally, philosophically Different. Correct. Different uh, beast altogether. Yeah. And that's why there's a really, well, it's probably a three way tussle, right? Because you've got the likes of Libra as well, which is effectively, you know, corporatized uh, alternatives backed by um, some sort of assets. You've got the central bank digital currencies, and then you've got yeah. the, the independent and, uh, you know, non centralized, very decentralized cryptocurrencies, which, of course, are Bitcoin and, and beyond. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be a really, really interesting uh, landscape as we see. Strap yourself uh, in. <laughs> yeah, well, I no, I think exactly right. And, you know, there's nobody who can call it as to how it's going to end up. But, you know, personally, um, I'm not completely enamored with what central banks have done to our economies around the world. So therefore, maybe um, the likes of Bitcoin have an important uh, role to play ahead. Um, I have one other question with regard to the halving. Sure. When when the sort of the price of Bitcoin moves, does it tend to flow on to other cryptocurrencies too? So could we see a, a reflective move in others, or up or down? How does that? How would you think it might might work? Uh, I guess you usually uh, other cryptocurrencies will kind of do what Bitcoin does. Often they'll do it to a larger extent. So there's a very high correlation between all the cryptocurrencies, and Bitcoin tends to be the, I guess, uh, the early mover, and then others will also follow and that will usually like if bitcoin goes up by x percent there'll be others that go up by a lot more than that and also uh, if, if if um yes so usually there's a very high correlation and, and that's what's happened in the past okay very interesting and then my final question for today is you know last time we did a show people said no no bitcoin is too slow too old there are other like xrp or ripple right which are actually are um better alternatives um just for our audience, can you just explain the differences between you know those sorts of different types of cryptos because they're not the same, are they? No, that, there's uh, so there's maybe a hundred different cryptocurrencies now or more. Mm. Uh, they all try to fill a different niche. Uh, so the Bitcoin niche, I suppose, originally was supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer internet cash type thing, but the technology, I, I guess, that it uses is maybe a little bit older than, the, than, I guess, what's being used by other cryptocurrencies. And it means that transactions may be a little bit slow. So therefore, people have treated Bitcoin more as a store of value rather than a currency they use to make, to, 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 rather than, than basically um, a currency they use, you know, to do um, any sort of international remittance or anything like that. So... Other, other currencies have come online that, you know, maybe are more efficient at um, making, say, um, um, individual payments. But then they have other aspects which are not the same as Bitcoin. So, so maybe they won't have a supply that's limited in the way that uh, um, the supply of Bitcoin is. Or 
maybe they'll be slightly controlled by a central party. So XRP, for example, one of the ones you mentioned, that's very controlled by Ripple. I mean, a lot of people will tell you that it's not, but Ripple is the company behind it, and Ripple hold, I think, $2 billion worth of XRP. So they could at any moment liquidate all, all your XRP if, if that's what they wanted to do and just completely move the market. Not to say that this is what they will do, but that's just an example. But an XRP payment will clear almost instantly. So there are different use cases for different cryptocurrencies. Right. And I think that's the important point for people to understand, right? So it's not like they're all the same, they're all controlled the same way or not controlled the same way, they're all functioning the same way. There is a, there is a, it's a bit like, a bit like the Wild West, right? But in the Wild West, there are some big players and some small players. And the critical yeah. thing to do is to understand, I guess, one, that, you know, they do, they will behave differently. And two, um, because they're not all the same, you can't bucket them all together and assume that, the, you know, the answer is going to be the, the same across the board, um, which is why it's such an interesting uh, sector of the market. Yeah, I think what you just basically said is that people should do their research before they invest. And that I, I completely, completely agree with that. <laughs> and I guess it's worth highlighting, you know, the market ultimately is driven by the confidence of those buying and selling. Yeah. Right. And, yes, and that, that's the thing to understand. So this, this market is all about, you know, people's perceptions, people's confidence levels. And that's one of the reasons why it's relatively volatile. I think, you know, as we may be um, beginning to approach a period where the market really heats up, I think I just want to say one more time, it's really important everyone really do their research about what they buy, how they invest, you know, beware of any scams. There's, there's lots of there's lots of things beginning to pop up, I guess, um, at the moment is, you know, um, in, there's all these websites now that, you know, may be based overseas somewhere. They'll pretend to be FX brokers. Uh, they're mostly scams. Just be really careful about that. We've seen a few people get involved with those. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you just need to be really, really careful because it kind of still is the Wild West. Mm, yeah, well, there's plenty of emails wishing around saying, hey, you know, monthly income guaranteed off Bitcoin. I'm thinking, yeah, sure. <laughs> if it sounds too good to be true, it most likely is. <laughs> I think so that's great, great advice, Adrian. Look, I appreciate your time today. And uh, pleasure. let's cycle back down the road as this uh, rather interesting journey continues. Absolutely. Great. Thanks All the best, that. mate. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. So there you have it. A really interesting conversation with Adrian today. And I think you can see some of the pros and cons of Bitcoin and crypto. But what do you think? Do you think crypto has a future or is it uh, destined always to be the Wild West? Let me know in the comments below. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.